Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing subgroups generated by subsets of a group. Okay, so we've now defined the subgroup generated by a certain subset of a group. So if you have a subset A of a group capital G, then the subgroup generated by that subset is defined to be the intersection of all subgroups of the group capital G that actually fully contain the subset A. And we know that when we intersect all of these subgroups together, we will still get a subgroup of G. In this case, it will still contain the subset A because all the things that we've intersected together contain the subset A. Uh, and indeed, it's going to be the smallest subgroup in the group capital G that contains the subset A because all other subgroups of the group capital G that contain the subset A will contain this intersection, this subgroup generated by A. Okay, so what I want to do firstly is just give you a little bit more nomenclature, a little bit more notation to do with this, and then what we'll talk about is another way of constructing this. So we'll define something called the closure of a subset A, and then we'll show that the closure of the subset A, which is defined in a different way, is actually going to be equal to the subset generated by A, so the two concepts are identical. Okay, so firstly, a little bit more nomenclature. So if this subset A is very simple, then we have different ways of denoting the subset, uh, sorry, the subgroup generated by the subset. So if the subset, for instance, is a subset that contains just a single element of the group, so let's say it contains little a, which is just a single element of our group, then instead of writing uh, the subgroup generated by the subset, subset. So instead of writing the subgroup generated by the subset that contains A, like so, what we just write is the subgroup generated by the element A, so we omit the set brackets like so, and just write the subgroup generated by the element A. And this is actually equal to the cyclic subgroup generated by A that we've defined in previous videos, and which we've denoted previously with these triangle brackets like so. So you can either use the triangular brackets, or you can use the curly brackets, it doesn't matter, to denote the cyclic subgroup generated by A. So why is the cyclic subgroup generated by A going to be the smallest subgroup generated by a single element? Well, of course, we define the cyclic subgroup generated by an element to be all powers of that element and all powers of its inverse. Okay, now any subgroup that contains this element A will have to contain all of the powers of A and all powers of A inverse, so it will have to contain the cyclic subgroup generated by A, so truly this is the smallest subgroup that contains this element A. So if you've got a set that just contains a single element, then rather than uh, calling the structure the subgroup generated by the subset that contains this single element A, we just call it the subgroup generated by the element A and denote it like so. Similarly, the more generalized form of this is if you've got a finite set capital A. So if you've got a finite set which contains a few elements, A1, A2, all the way along to AN, okay, and you want to generate the subgroup that uh, contains this subset A, the subgroup generated by this subset. Instead of writing the subgroup generated by the subset that contains A1, A2, all the way along to AN, like so, we just write it as the subgroup generated by the elements A1, A2, all the way along to AN, like so. So it's denoted in this way rather than this way. Again, we omit uh, the set brackets here. We just put uh, the subgroup generated by the elements A1, A2, all the way along to AN. Okay, so there's some more notation. And finally, if you want to talk about the subgroup generated by two subsets, we write it like so. The subgroup generated by A, and then we put a comma for AND, AND B. So this means the uh, subgroup generated by A and B, where A and B are both subsets of the group capital G. Now, of course, this will just be the subgroup of G, the smallest subgroup of G that contains the subset A and the subset B. But another way of writing this would be that it is the subgroup generated by the subset that is A union B. However, you will very rarely see anyone ever denote this like so. 
Okay, instead you would see it written like this, the subgroup generated by the subset A and the subset B, rather than the subgroup generated by A union B. But of course these two things are identical. Okay, so there's the notation that is more commonly seen. Okay, for the same concept, however. Okay, so that's the end of the nomenclature section. Now let's actually have a look at this concept of the closure of A. So, I have defined how to construct the subgroup generated by a subset A, and this truly is going to be the smallest subgroup of the group capital G that contains the subset capital A. However, this is a reasonably impractical way of actually constructing the smallest subgroup that contains the subset capital A. So what we're now going to do is an easier way to actually construct it, okay? And the way we're initially going to do this is we're going to call this subset a different thing because we're not initially going to be totally sure that this is actually the same thing as this. However, we will then prove that they are the same thing and therefore that we can use this other concept to actually construct the subgroup generated by the subset. Okay, so what we're going to define is the closure of the subset A, and this is denoted as it often is in many other topics of mathematics. So there's often, you know, all over the place in mathematics, there's the concept of the closure of a set in different areas. Okay, here we're talking about the closure of a subset uh, to make a subgroup. Okay, and as usual, it's denoted A bar. Okay, so A bar. So we're going to define the closure of a subset, and this closure is going to be a subgroup. So we're going to extend this subset to make it a subgroup. Okay, and the way this is going to work is quite complicated when you see it for the first time, but it's not as scary as it looks, okay? So bear with this definition. Okay, so the closure of A, A bar, is defined to be the set that contains all finite length products, by which of course I mean compositions, uh, of elements from the set capital A and um, all of the inverses of the set capital A. So let me just firstly, before I actually write this out, we'll have the set A here. Okay, and the set A will contain lots of elements, so here's the set A. Now what you can do is you can then construct the set of all the inverses for the elements of A. Okay, so if I've got an element little a in the set A here, what there'll be over here is A inverse. So for each of the elements of A, you can also find its inverse in the larger group capital G. Okay, now of course some of the inverses of the elements here might actually already be in this subset A, but then on the other hand, there might be some elements here whose inverse is not in the subset A, and that will only be in this subset. Okay, so here's A, and here's the set of all the inverses of the elements in A. Okay, what I'm now going to do is I'm going to construct every possible finite length product from elements in these two sets. Okay, so I'm going to write this out like so. So you'll have a1 to the plus or minus 1. So you pick your first element, and it will either be the um, element from here, or it will be the inverse of that element over here. Okay, then you'll have a2 to the plus or minus 1, a3 to the plus or minus 1, etc., all the way along to an to the plus or minus 1, okay, where all of these ai's are elements of the set capital A, and n is some um, integer that is greater than or equal to 0. Okay, so let me explain this. So what you are doing here is you're constructing every single finite length product of elements from the set A and their inverses. Okay, so this first element here, A1, A1 would be some element from this set capital A. So you pick an element, you decide, do you want it, or do you want its inverse over here? So if it's you want it, then you put plus one up here. If you want its inverse, you put negative one. Okay, then you product this with another element, which is going to be A2 here. And again, A2 will be an element of the set A, and either you can have it, plus 1, or you can have its inverse, negative 1. Okay, and you continue on in this way, creating finite products, and you can construct absolutely a huge number of different finite products here, and you're going to put every single one of them into this set A bar here. Now, let me stress here, it is not the case that all of these are distinct. So A1 might be the same as A3, for instance. Okay, I could have an element appearing more than once. Okay, and you might ask, well, why wouldn't you just move them next to each other and have A to the power of 2 here? Okay, well, because we're not 
sure that we're working with an obedient group. This could be a non-commutative group, okay, so you don't know that you can just move things around. So basically, it's absolutely every single finite length product that you can construct from elements in the set capital A and um, inverses of the elements in the set capital A. You construct every single product. All of the answers, of course, will be in the group capital G. You put in all of the answers into this great big set that you can get to by taking finite length products of elements in the set A and uh, the, their inverses, and you put those all into this set, and that's the concept of the closure of A. Okay, so this is a very complicated thing to construct. There are a lot of finite products that you would have to go through, but it's still more accessible than this, okay, than doing this. So this is another, well, we haven't actually shown yet that this set is actually going to be equal to the subgroup generated by the subset A, but I'll let the cat out of the bag, it is. Um, but this is still a more accessible route to get to it than that. Okay, right, so the first thing that I want to show is that this structure that we formed here is actually going to be a subgroup of the group capital G, okay, and then what we want to show is that indeed it's actually going to be equal to the subgroup generated by the subset A. Okay, right, so actually before we go, uh, before we actually even prove that it's a subgroup of capital G, let me just uh, make a few comments. Firstly, that the subset capital A is always going to be inside this, so A is going to be a subset of A bar. And the reason is, of course, when you're constructing finite length products, you can always just have a product of length 1, and then uh, you can let A1 equal any element of the set capital A, so you'll certainly get every single element of the subset capital A in this A bar. So that's the first comment that you should make. The other comment I should make is, what if the subset capital A is equal to the empty set? Okay, how would you do this if uh, A was equal to the empty set? Well, of course you can't do it if A is equal to the empty set. You've got absolutely no elements to construct your finite length products out of. So, we make a definition here, and the definition is because we want the closure of a subset always to equal a subgroup. Okay, so we are going to define the closure of the empty set to be equal to the trivial subgroup. Okay, now you might not fully understand, well, why on earth is that? Why wouldn't it be the empty set? But we want the closure of a subset to always be a subgroup, so that's why we're making that definition. Okay, but as I say, you can't actually apply this to construct this. Okay, we're just defining that to be the case, so that the closure of any subset of A, whether it's an empty set or not, is actually always going to be a subgroup. Okay, right, so now let's actually see why for all other subsets that are not the empty set, the closure of that subset is going to be a subgroup. Okay, so of course it is going to be a subset, it's going to completely contain our set capital A, and if uh, A is non-empty, which we're now assuming it is, uh, that means that A bar is going to be non-empty. Okay, so it is going to be a subset of capital G, now we need to prove that it obeys the axioms of a subgroup. So firstly, we need to prove closure. We need to prove that if we compose any two elements together, we'll end up with another element. Well, remember, everything in here is one of these finite length products of elements of the set capital A and their inverses. So let's take two elements. So we'll have A1 to the power of plus or minus 1, A2 to the power of plus or minus 1, all the way along to An to the power of plus or minus 1. That's some element in uh, A closure here. And let's have another element, which we'll denote by Bs. So we'll have B1 to the power of plus or minus 1, B2 to the power of plus or minus 1, all the way along to Bm to the power of plus or minus 1. That's also going to be an element uh, of this set A closure. So both of these are from A closure. So these are just finite length products of elements of the set capital A and their inverses. Okay, and what we now want to show is that if you compose these together, you'll end up with something else that's in A closure. Okay, so of course, composing these together, what we'll end up with is A1 to the power of plus or minus 1, A2 to the power of plus or minus 1, all the way along to An to the power of plus or minus 1, times B1 to the power of plus or minus 1, B2 to the power of plus or minus 1, all the way along to bm to the power of plus or minus 1, and clearly, this is still just a finite product of elements of the set A and their inverses, so this is still going to be an element of A bar. This is one of the things that you will have to actually work out 
to find another element in A bar. Okay, so this is still going to be an A bar. So when we construct the, sorry, when we compose these uh, finite products of elements of the set A uh, and their inverses, you will still end up with something that is a finite product of elements of the subset A and their inverses. Okay, so it is going to be closed under composition. Okay, let's now check axiom number three. So again, I'm skipping out axiom number two, associativity. We don't need to worry about that one. Uh, so we'll go on to axiom number three. We want to show that the identity will be there. So why will the identity be there? Well, consider the product where you just take a certain element of the subset A. So let's say little a is just an element of the subset A. So one of the finite products that will end up in the closure of A is going to be A composed with A's inverse. Okay, this is going to be an A bar. So what have I done here? I've just put as my A1 A, okay, to the power of plus 1, and as my A2 I've put A, but then I've had it to the power of minus 1. And when I actually work out that finite product here, and it's just a product of two things clearly here, of course I'll get the identity element. So the identity element is therefore going to be an A bar. So the identity is going to be an A bar. Okay, and of course you could have used whatever element you like from the set capital A. Okay, it would have still worked. Uh, so, you're just assuming that A is a non-empty set, which of course we've assumed because we've already dealt with the empty set, so there was some element that I could use to do this with. Okay, and now axiom number five, inverses. So I want to show that any element in A bar is going to have an inverse. So of course, I'll have uh, an arbitrary element of A bar will look like this, A1 to the power of plus or minus 1, A2 to the power of plus or minus 1, all the way along to An to the power of plus or minus 1. Okay, so this is an element of A bar. To construct its inverse, what shall I do? Well, I'll take A n, the same element of A here, but then do it to the power of minus plus 1. So just whichever one you've got here, take the inverse. So if you've got plus 1 here, you'd have negative 1 here. If you had negative 1 here, you'd have plus 1 here. Then I'd have A n minus 1, again, minus plus 1 now. And then we go down, A 2 minus plus 1, A 1 minus plus 1. Okay, and then of course if you were to compose this with this, this would cancel with this, okay, they'd be each other's inverse. The next one here, AM minus 1, would cancel with this one, etc. They'd all cancel to give uh, the identity element overall. And of course this is still going to be an element of A bar, because it's still just uh, a finite product of elements of the set A and their inverses. Okay, so indeed uh, we, we are going to have inverses in this subset A bar. Okay, so I hope that proving that A bar is a subgroup has given you a little bit more intuition for this actual subset A bar of the group capital G. Okay, so that then is the definition of the closure of a subset A. And for any subset A, you can actually construct the closure of A, and we now know that it is going to be a subgroup of the group capital G. Now, we'll have a break here, and in the next video what we'll do is prove that the closure of a subset A is actually equivalent to the subgroup generated uh, by the subset A, how the two are absolutely the same thing. So we will no longer use this notation A bar, we will just use the curly bracket notation, the subgroup generated by a subset A. However, it will be useful to uh, have this explicit way of constructing the subgroup generated by a subset A, which the closure has given us.